everybody and welcome back to another episode of In The Booth. Uh, today I got all my gear on. Today I'm all McLaren. Super excited to go over this next car. Also very frustrated to go over this next car. I have a lot of feelings around its uh, history in terms of value and basically the way it was so superior and how so many people love it and, and nobody seems to want to hold on and nobody seems to want to sort of carry that torch. So a car that's uh, really, really put uh, um, a sub-brand for McLaren on the map, which has turned into a pretty big thing and a pretty exciting thing. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that the tides are finally turning. So without further ado, I give you the 675 LT. So where do I start? The P11 chassis introduced in 2009, and you guys can reference one of the older videos, um, was what the MP412C was born off of. And that chassis, that you know, single monocoque chassis with the um, aluminum substructures, brought in a whole new level of stiffness and lightweight and safety into the segment, uh, which would fill Huracan Gallardo 458 in that sort of world. As the car progressed, it was, um, you know, it continued this evolution. Um, basically, development would carry on. It grew into the 650S, which then accompanied the new Speedmark headlight, which was borrowed from the P1 and started to give McLaren its identity. Fast forward to the very end of the P11 chassis, and we have what is eternally called the P11R 675LT. Now, as most of you know, LT stands for long tail, which is basically a derivative of the McLaren F1 GTR, which elongated the rear end to give the car more aero efficiency and more downforce. And then of course, an extension in the front here, which basically made the car overall longer. The LT's approach was really pretty incredible. When you look at cars like the 458 Speciale, when you look at certain other cars like the, you know, Gallardo Superleggera and all that other stuff, and you know, even going up into now with 48 Pista and, uh, and um, Huracan Performante STO. The STO, maybe I'll remove for that. We'll get to that later. But the Performante, those cars are all basically standard, supercar level vehicles, which have had little bits and pieces kind of added to it, a little more power, a little more this, a little that, almost like a modified version of that car. Whereas the 675 LT long tail specifically was a new development. Yes, it's on P11 chassis, but there's absolutely nothing shared from every body panel on this car with a standard 650S. Let's start with the exterior. Obviously, they did a really good job of encompassing that whole 650S MP412C look. However, a lot, a lot, a lot of changes. Starting from the front, we got that big full carbon fiber front nose. All this stuff is full carbon fiber. There's nothing here that is made of carbonate plastic or aluminum or anything like that. So starting with the bumper cover and then of course the front chin spoiler, all this arrow, these conard sections over here with the uh, gills on the side, all that stuff there is all development. The only thing that this car shares with a 650S is the hood. Going up to the polycarbonate fenders, you have this beautiful, beautiful flow. These are actually slightly accentuated out over a standard 650S following into a door that's completely, completely remodeled to take in the additional aero side pieces that we have down here at the bottom. Very, very nice construction, finally flowing to these actually much wider. You can actually see it versus the 650S. There's a little bit of divot here. This thing extends out and these rear quarter panels are off full carbon fiber. That's why you actually see in a lot of 675 LTs that the paint finishes kind of adjust once you get to the rear quarter panel, because in here to make sure this is flat, they've had to use all kinds of material filler and things of that nature to get it smoothed out so they can paint the car and get it to match the rest of the car as much as possible. Moving on to the back, obviously this one being fitted with Club, Club Sport Pack Pro, you have the full carbon exterior rear spoiler and air brake, following down to these gorgeous, gorgeous rear end with these beautiful, beautiful Inconel titanium exhaust pipes finishing off the whole look. Just in the weight savings alone, 
with this carbon rear shell, with the fenders in the back, the strip out of the floor, bearing the beautiful carbon tub, and all the other little things like the thinner glass that they put on this car, the polycarbonate rear glass on this thing, which is super lightweight. It actually doesn't even have latches to hold it on. There's actually a tool mechanism to release that and open it up with this beautiful little carbon pop rod that you can use to hold the thing up. Absolutely beautiful. And all of that combined saved us over 200 kilos in weight. That's how much this thing shed. We're not talking about 100 pounds, we're not talking about 150 pounds, over 200 kilos. It's crazy. Moving on from there, we got to the power unit. 650S was a good, good power unit. 12C was very good. 650S, they were able to sort of liven it up. The engine got a little bit more torquey. The car would rip the rear tires over. The, the, the power control of the 12C, I think, was almost a little bit too easy. Uh, very, very fast car, propelled you quite well, but really, really ramped up in power. It never really gave you that turbo thrust. 650S stepped in the right direction, but the 666 horsepower M838TR in this thing, phew, new level. The power of the 675T, uh, 675LT is relentless. It delivers, delivers, delivers. And when that turbo boost comes on, God give it, these, uh, these Trofeo R's are hanging on for dear life, trying to control the power and put it down. But if you want to go sideways in a McLaren, this is definitely one that's going to be able to do it for you. A lot of other tinkering happened with the engine on this thing too. Not, not just in the internals, which uh, included like, car, um, sorry, titanium rods, revised cylinder heads, different camshaft profiles. A lot of interior of the engine's been, been changed over to increase performance and robustness. But this is also the first MA38T engine to encompass McLaren's new tubular stainless steel exhaust manifold, which then changed the note of the McLaren MA38T engine from here on. If you'll notice, if you listen to a 650S, a 12C, or a P1, you have this bassy, baritone type sound. That's because that engine uses a pretty common exhaust manifold being made of, you know, full iron. And each primary would plumb into one pipe and then circulate over to a collector where the turbocharger would connect to. This engine has a beautiful tubular four-piece four piece runner stainless steel header which goes four into one like a traditional header. That's where the collector is and then the turbocharger attaches to that. That's the way they're able to exploit the, uh, I don't really want to say it, but I guess the Ferrari-ish high pitch sound that the new generation engine had. If you listen to a 570S, it has a lot in relation with the sound to this car because every M838T and M840T engine since then has had this exhaust manifold. Really, really changed things. For the better, in this particular car, yes, because one thing that the LT has kind of over a lot of these other cars, and I think this is what makes the 675 LT the more uh, honest car. And I use that word a lot, and I like to use it specifically when a manufacturer is being honest. When you really ramp this thing up and you really start to cook it and really lay into the boost and really get the engine hot, you start to get these like downshift backfires and all these pops that start to happen. But they're not engineered like the other manufacturers, like a Huracan where you downshift a gear and it does the same three little backfires every time. It changes. It depends on the temperature. It depends on what's happening with the motor. Obviously in cars like this, when you're running a lot of turbocharged power, they do use fuel to cool the motor a little bit, the combustion chamber, so they overfuel it, which sometimes will create that backfire, you know? But that's in the management and health of the engine, not in the, hey man, I wanna be cool, listen to my downshifts. Super, super lame. And that's what makes the LT power plant very, very special. Now connect that to their latest software, DCT7 speed, man. This thing just cooks. It just amazing power delivery, amazing shifts, the sharpest you've ever felt. The downshifts are like lightning fast. Again, another car that I feel has made everybody step up the game. Speciali, Performante, GT3, GT3 RS. All those cars were great, 
great upgrades from what they were standard, but they weren't the evolution that McLaren gave you. You really do get more with your money. From there, all concentration went to suspension and the handling dynamics of this car. Now, another really, really trick thing about the LT is that the suspension uprights and everything you see underneath the car is all borrowed from the P1, including those beautiful TIG welded aero control arms. They're the most gorgeous thing you've ever seen, beautifully made by hand. Then you see that beautiful upright that holds all the brake assembly and everything on it, all machined out from one piece of forged aluminum, like just sexy race stuff, sexy race stuff. Plumbing all the way to the back, this car has its beautiful flat floor, bringing it to the rear suspension, which is all, again, borrowed basically from the P1. And that's what helps deliver all the power to these gorgeous, super lightweight wheels, which you get with the, you know, with the uh, Pro package when spec new. Amazing, amazing, amazing detail there. The suspension hydraulics obviously carry McLaren's proactive chassis system, which gives you all this lightning uh, adjustability around the car sway bar less vehicle again so you have all the suspension working to keep the car flat and these things are adjusting so lightning quick they're you know these accumulators are filled they're pressurized as soon as the car pitches it will it will stabilize it bring it back up to level make sure that the arrow is efficient as efficient as possible all the time like it's so so crazy and I don't think I've ever spoken to a single human being that has owned one or driven one that has not said it's one of the best cars they've ever had or owned. But they're the problem. Since the LT was introduced, a car like this would have had about a $430,000 USD price tag, closer to 600,000 Canadian at the time. And of course the initial rush for the vehicle was great. You know, we're still relatively new in 2016. We are now in our fourth year as a dealer group or a dealer network and a car manufacturer. And, um, you know, this is our first time giving you that specialty limited production, one of 500 coupes in this particular case, car. And we were really excited about that. And we sold them all out. As soon as they were launched, you know, we were trying to be a little particular about who got one, but our Rolodex is pretty small. So, you know, you got your usual guys who are uh, going to be uh, opportunistic and, and, and buy one to flip it and make a quick buck as the car was really hot and it was the latest and greatest. But after that, there was a lot of movement, like a ton of movement. There still is a ton of movement because for some reason, every time somebody buys this car, they don't commit to it. They don't commit to the ideology of this car. And that's been the problem with the LT ever since. Today, this particular example is gonna go for sale here in Canada for 370,000 Canadian dollars, which is uh, 40 grand more than a brand new Artura. A one of 500, super lightweight, limited production supercar. I don't think anybody has a bargain like that right now. And now we've started to notice in the last six, seven months that we got a lot of more key people buying these cars from us. Guys that we know are buy and hold guys. Guys who understand that this car is simply just too cheap right now. And I hope that continues to happen because I feel like it's been disrespected and it's bothered me like crazy. This particular example here is a US specification car. We pulled it out of a McLaren dealer for a client of ours in 2017. This one, again, outfitted with the Club Sport Pack Pro package, finished in chicane gray, which is the launch color, beautiful, with the P1 bucket, with the beautiful McLaren orange seat surrounds. All McLaren orange stitch inside, of course, when you do that Club Sport uh, Club Pack Pro Kit, you get the super lightweight wheel, you get all this exterior carbon fiber, you get the rear wing and carbon fiber, um, a bunch of other little things as well in the interior. Just beautiful. The one thing you don't get with the US spec ones though is the titanium roll cage, which is only available in Canada. And there is one in Canada at our Vancouver store right now. I believe it is coming back to our Toronto store now. That is one of three that were ever sold in Canada. So there's a lot of little subcars within this entire thing that have special options, which can 
help push you a little bit more to sort of spend a little bit more money and get that specialty version of this car. Its counterpart right now, or its main rival, is maybe the 458 Speciale, which fails in absolutely every way against this car. But the values have remained very strong. Obviously, it has one certain thing about it, which is it's the last of that naturally aspirated generation car. But you know what? One of our colleagues had a 458 Speciale about three, four years ago. And I remember it was taking me for a rip. We headed on the 407. He lays into it and I basically looked over him and I said, uh, I think if you bought a regular 458, you would be equally as happy than this. So that's when he, exactly what he went and did. He sold the Speciale and he went and bought himself a regular 458. And in some instances, he actually felt like the 458 felt quicker, a little bit more raw, actually a little bit more engaging. Maybe the Speciale was over, maybe slightly over refined, despite the fact that they stripped it out a little bit more. But when you compare it to this thing, it just doesn't have anything to offer. This car is truly, truly fast. In the quarter mile, this thing will probably rip off a high nine. <laughs> it, like, it's, it's, it's like not even in the same league of performance. And then it's lightweight construction, the P1 suspension along with the GT3 front steering rack. Oh my God, this is like feeling like it's a, GT, a real GT3 car, like a GT3 race car. So I stand here, lift off my hat, scratching my head, because I don't get it. And I don't get you guys either. I think you should get on board. I think you should take them all you can, because one day it is gonna matter. And I think it's gonna come sooner than we think, because these cars are starting to get away from us now. Electrification, hybrid technology, all that stuff is coming in. Stuff like this ain't gonna exist anymore. This is already becoming a bit of a relic. So if I were you, get on the LT bandwagon, jump on, pay what you gotta pay, get the cars, put them away, become custodians, give them the respect they deserve. This beautiful one is coming up for sale now. Our white one is headed back to Toronto and we're continuously looking for more to add. Get on it, enjoy. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time.